Hello, my name is Sonali Mahalanabis, and I will be presenting today's webinar on the use of EvaGreen for multiplexing and other applications on the QX200 Droplet Digital PCR system. Before we begin, please take note of the information under the welcome box to the right of the presentation. There's some helpful hints there to manage the, dis the size of your display and also for uh, help with audio settings. First, we will begin by looking at some con considerations for EVA green assays and the possible applications. As you will see, EVA green offers an advantage in that multiplexing is possible with just the single color or dye in the QX200, an image of which is shown here on the bottom right of your screen. So towards this, I'll explain some unique features of DDPCR data analysis for evergreen assays and the ways in which these features may be applied to allow for single color multiplexing. So Evergreen is a DNA intercalating dye in many ways similar to Cybergreen. There are some advantages over Cybergreen, which I will not discuss here, but that are well known. What I'd like to mention, though, is that it does offer certain benefits over the alternative of using probe assays. For example, you can essentially move over your CyberGreen qPCR assays to the Drop the Digital QX200 platform since you can now use EvaGreen in the system. And because you just need basically your two primers and no probe, it's going to be naturally lower in cost and complexity of assay design. And finally, as you will hopefully see here, it opens the door to several different kinds of applications involving multiplexing. Let's begin with a brief overview of some concepts that are going to be important to describe in terms of multiplexing with Eva Green in DDPCR. Here's what a typical 1D QX200 data plot looks like. This shows the fluorescence amplitude, or RFU, on the y-axis of two clusters of a DDPCR reaction read in the QX200. In black is the negative droplet cluster at the bottom of the plot, and in blue is the cluster of positive droplets at much higher amplitude indicating that these droplets contain PCR amplicons. Please note that these two populations of droplets are separated by a threshold indicated by the pink line. The purpose of this threshold is to delineate that droplets above this amplitude are positive for amplification, but droplets below this line are basically negative for amplification. This basic concept is very important in understanding how we can use this information to do multiplexing. Now in this graph, you see just one positive population. But what if we had two or three or even more amplicons? Maybe one population of positives is much higher and another a little lower in amplitude, as shown here. Could we then have multiple yet separate positive droplet populations and use that to determine if we have multiple different amplicons? In other words, can we multiplex? And of course the answer is yes. And this has been described as seeing the white space between the negative and positive droplets as a blank canvas of sorts. 
depending on our ability to position different populations of droplets across this blank white space, we can detect multiple populations and perform multiplexing. Now let's learn about a few other important concepts that will allow us to alter the position of droplets in our blank canvas. One of these factors is annealing temperature. How does annealing temperature affect the plot? Well, in qPCR, it isn't really possible to exclude the fluorescence signal from off-target amplicons or primer dimers. However, in DDPCR, any signal from primer dimers can easily be excluded simply by raising the pink threshold line above those droplets to exclude them. That is what is going to be illustrated here. So in this plot, data is shown from a temperature gradient experiment with NTCs or no template control shown on the left part of the graph and with template on the right. The primer dimers are shown here in this region circled in red. Notice that that is positioned underneath the pink threshold line. Once that is done, those are no longer counted in a positive population and therefore are, exclu are excluded by thresholding. Once those primer dimers are excluded by thresholding, only the true amplicons are counted as positive droplets. Here is another example of this concept of basically being able to distinguish different products from your intended target amplicon in DDPCR. Again, something not possible in qPCR. The NTC data here on the left section of the leftmost plot shows what a clean assay looks like with no primer dimers present over a temperature gradient. Here, the temperature gradient shown ranges from 55 to 66 degrees. However, with the addition of template still on the leftmost graph, you now see that you have the generation of off-target or non-specific products. As expected, that occurs at a lower annealing temperature, or around 55 degrees. However, these off-target products can easily be excluded from the target amplicon since the correct product is spatially differentiable from the off-target products, as shown in the middle 2D plot. The product is shown as a blue cluster, whereas the off-target amplification products are shown as a diffuse banding in gray. Therefore, one can accurately determine the target concentration even when off-target amplicons or primer dimers may be present. The target concentration calls are shown on the graph on the right. Now we look at the ways in which we can drive changes in fluorescence amplitudes of amplicons on 1D plots and EVA green assays. Again, that is how we move the location of our positive droplets in order to do multiplexing. The first method of two that we'll talk about is based on amplicon length. Shown here are three different assays resulting 
and a 62 base pair product on the left, a 99 base pair product in the middle, and a 200 base pair product on the right. Now, for assays with similar efficiency and primer concentration, larger amplicons will exhibit positive droplets at higher amplitudes. And that's true because more evergreen dye is going to bind larger size amplicons. Now, this is true up to a certain amplicon size of about 400 base pairs or so, after which efficiency of the reaction starts to fail. Starts to fall, I apologize. Now, remember that blank canvas analogy? So let's think about how this relates to that. It's important to note that by changing the amplicon size, we can change the location of the positive droplets. Essentially move it up or down in that white space between the negative and positive droplet populations. You may notice that the negative population of droplets is also moving slightly. That does happen and that is primer dependent or assay dependent. So different primers or assays may actually have slightly different negative droplet amplitudes as well. So how does this look when different targets are amplified together for multiplexing? That's what we try to show here using two different targets. So this shows the 1D plot on the left and 2D plot in the middle for RPP30 and beta actin amplified both separately and together in the same well. Since the amplicon sizes are appreciably different, 62 base pairs versus 137 base pairs, the two amplicons are detected at different fluorescence amplitudes. The concentration determined from the single plex and the duplex reactions are the same for each gene. In other words, multiplexing does not affect your concentration call. Another example of multiplexing could be the use of multiplexing to detect splice variants in gene expression. Alternate splicing events result in RNA of various lengths, and these amplicons may be detected as shown in this 1D plot since different lengths give rise to changes in amplitude in the 1D plot. For example, here the main mRNA population designated by the letter C can be differentiated from two additional splice variants, A and B just simply due to amplicon size. Another example of multiplexing based on amplicon length is the use of DDPCR for measuring telomerase activity using TRAP, which stands for tel Telomere Repeat Amplification Protocol. The DDPCR TRAP assay is not only much quicker and technically easier to perform, but also allows for increased sensitivity and accuracy of quantification of telomerase activity at the single cell level as compared to traditional methods of PCR or radiolabeled gels. TRAP directly measures the addition of telomere repeats to a telomerase substrate and detects extension products via radial labeling on a polyacrylamide gel or by PCR. In DDPCR, the absolute number of telomerase extended DNA molecules 
instead is quantified from very small cell numbers, such as in clinical samples. Now let's look at another approach to multiplexing with Eva Green assays. The second method utilizes changes in primer concentration. Shown here is an assay with decreasing concentration of primer from left to right. Now as the primer concentration decreases, you see a decrease in both the positive and negative droplet amplitudes. Of note is that although you see higher amplitudes of positives at higher concentrations, since the negative droplet amplitude also increases, the ultimately the separation between the two clusters starts to decrease. So the ideal primer concentration would be one where you have high enough fluorescence amplitude for your positives, but also good separation between your positive and negative droplet clusters. So again, we can vary the primer concentration to affect the spatial distribution of positive droplets in the 1D and 2D plots. Now this property, as we've seen before, can be used to our advantage when multiplexing. And that's what's shown here. Two targets again, R for RPP30 and M for MRGPRX1 were amplified. Since the amplicons are of similar size here at around 70 base pairs, amplicon length, which we discussed previously, cannot be used as a differentiator. However, by altering the primer concentrations of one assay, relative to another, we can change the location and the amount of product of the positive droplets on the plot. So shown here on the leftmost plot, the primer concentrations used are 50, 100, and 150 nanomolar for both assays. As expected, the amplitude of the positive droplets increases with increasing primer concentration. Then RPP30 was assayed with 150 nanomolars of primer, whereas only 50 nanomolars primer was used for MRGPRX1. One D plot in the middle and the 2D plot on the right show the relative locations of the positive droplets for either assay, separately and then in the same well. Since RPP30 amplified to a greater degree due to higher primer concentration, the amplitude of these droplets is of greater fluorescence. Thus, basic, thus, the two amplicons can be easily differentiated and quantified as separate clusters. Finally, I wanted to leave you with some practical considerations when thinking about Eva Green on the QX200. First, in the latest versions of the Quantisoft software, used to run the QX200 instrument and analyze your data, the correct supermix must be selected for accurate quantification of the data. Therefore, an option has been added where the DDPCR Evergreen supermix in the drop-down menu may be selected as your supermix in the plate setup window shown here. Next are some recommendations we have for Evergreen assays. 
Although concentrations outside these ranges may be used, these are the recommendations for most assays. Primer concentration optimally that we suggest would fall in the range of 100 to 250 nanomolar. For amplicon size, typically the optimal size is 80 to 250 base pairs. However, you can certainly generate larger amplicons of 500 to 1500 base pairs by modifying the protocol to include a third step for an extension. And finally, there is an additional signal stabilization step in the cycling protocol for the Evergreen Supermix, which is not required when using probe supermixes. Please refer to the Evergreen Supermix product insert for these and additional details when setting up for an Evergreen reaction. So in summary, Evergreen allows you to do multiplexing in the same well with just using a single color. The level of amplification as indicated by fluorescence amplitude directly relates to the mass of DNA amplicon that is generated by PCR. So by altering the DNA mass or amplitude, you can affect that spatial distribution of positive droplets. Positive droplet amplitude may be altered by amplicon length or primer concentration. This enables quantification of multiple targets in the same well and differentiation from off-target amplicons. This concludes my presentation today.